Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. This is a special South by Southwest edition of Fast Forward, and I have a very special guest today. It is Joe Lubin, the CEO and founder of Consensus. He is one of the godfathers of Ethereum, and, uh, and we're going to talk about blockchain, we're going to talk about Ethereum, we're going to talk about the turbulent year that the, block, that the uh, crypto market has had in the last year, and more importantly, what role blockchain is going to fill in our future. Joe, thanks so much for talking to me today. Great to be here. So blockchain is a technology that has alternatively been described as the next big thing in technologies similar to the internet, um, perhaps even surpassing it. And it's also been described as a glorified spreadsheet. And there are arguments all along that spectrum. You are obviously more of an optimist than most. Um, tell me why the world needs blockchain. Uh, so it is a glorified spreadsheet. Uh, we glorify um, that particular um, technology, which is a ledger technology, because it uh, changes the nature of trust in human relationships, in business. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, we built thousands of years of technology um, on a foundation of trust that is subjective, that is based in centralized institutions, that is uh, run by people, sometimes reasonably well, sometimes more capriciously. Um, and uh, we now have this, and so old style databases um, basically forced companies uh, to build siloed walled garden systems uh, to conduct their business. And uh, APIs on the internet enable us to link in a kludgy way one of these systems to another of these systems. And if this one changes, this one breaks. And um, so this new database technology enables us to um, be certain that uh, um, even if up to half of the actors on these systems are malicious, nobody can cheat the system. And, and so you can have a spreadsheet that everybody types numbers into, uh, and everybody can know that uh, everybody agrees on those numbers, basically. And there's, there's no way for a minority set of actors to improperly manipulate those numbers. And so, uh, we can take the thousands of years of technology that we've built and we can now uh, place it on a, a much more sound trust foundation. We can create agreements that are guaranteed to execute. We can uh, use that trust to build natively digital assets or digital assets that represent uh, uh, assets in the real world. And uh, um, the thesis is that uh, economic, social, and political systems built on that foundation will be much more uh, trustworthy. So let's, um, before we go too deep, let's talk about just some definitional terms. Sure. Um, the differences between blockchain, between uh, Bitcoin, and then Ethereum, uh, and sort of what the, just explain what the, how those concepts are different. Sure, so blockchain is a database technology, um, and essentially you can, so we could sort of set up a blockchain here in this room, let's say there were 10 people in this room, whenever anybody changed uh, the, the numbers on their scratch pad, they shout it out and everybody agrees um, to change the numbers on their scratch pad and everybody's kept in sync. So that, that's basically the, uh, uh, the equivalent of what the, the blockchain technology does. Um, it's a ledger and it's guaranteed, um, virtually mathematically guaranteed to be kept in sync even if there are 20,000 of them running around the world. Um, in order to get 20,000 of them running around the world, say on the Ethereum network, you have to incentivize people to share their resources. Uh, and so um, because these systems are trustworthy, you can issue a natively digital asset. Um, in the case of uh, Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum, um, it's called Bitcoin or Ether. Uh, and every time uh, a block is created, every time a set of transactions is packaged up and time stamped in these databases, um, the entity that is doing that, and it's sort of a, a, a puzzle that gets solved in a race to, to actually sealing up a block of transactions. Um, every time that happens, the person who is devoting their uh, compute hardware and paying for the electricity to, to run the system uh, gets rewarded with some of these native assets, uh, so Ether, Bitcoin, and, and it can be tens of thousands of dollars for each time somebody wins one of those races. So um, blockchain is the database technology, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, and, and some people call uh, DLT, 
decentralized or distributed ledger technology uh, blockchain because it doesn't necessarily involve this incentivization element. You don't necessarily need a token in order to uh, get people to share their resources to run a system like this in a decentralized fashion. So blockchain could apply to a much more centrally controlled version of the technology. And so the tokens are really just a reflection of the computing power that's required in order to keep the system running. Um, the tokens incentivize people to share their resources and they um, since everybody's validating transactions um, to um, acquire some of these tokens, um, that act serves to secure the network. Uh, so if the token is worthless or, or very inexpensive, um, you don't have that many people caring about it and you don't have a very secure network. It would be easy for a group to um, get lots of compute resources and sensor transactions or, or change some of the history of the network. So. Um, the value of having a very valuable token is that it provides security to the network. By creating a, a more distributed platform, a lot of demand and encouraging people to share their computing resources. Yeah, the trust comes from being more distributed or more, more decentralized. If, uh, if we had only 50 of these nodes uh, or 21 of these nodes, uh, um, you know, there's much more opportunity for taking over the network or for collusion amongst the entities that are producing blocks on the network. But if you have 20,000 of those things and they're owned by, let's say, 20,000 different people, uh, that's, uh, it's hard to coordinate them to cheat the system. So I think a lot of people, and the way I think of Bitcoin, is it primarily as a, as a currency or, yeah. or an investment, perhaps? Um, Ether, Ether and Ethereum have sort of grander ambitions. Um, can you explain, and Consensus, your company, is sort of dedicated to furthering those greater ambitions of, of Ethereum. Can you explain what those ambitions look like? Uh, yeah, so Bitcoin was the first, actually it wasn't the first cryptocurrency, it was the first decentralized cryptocurrency. So it solved this double spend problem where I shouldn't be able to send you one Bitcoin then send that same Bitcoin to, to her. Mm -hmm. um, and to basically ensure that that is done in a decentralized way. So um, banks are able to do that by having a single um, database. Mm -hmm. um, and so the breakthrough was the decentralization. Um, Ether uh, is the token on the Ethereum network and, and we always positioned Ether as a crypto fuel. Uh, it's one of the first crypto commodities conceived uh, and crypto commodities are, are basically um, elements in a new kind of economy uh, and uh, the fuel, the crypto fuel pays for compute, computational operations on the Ethereum network, also pays for storing data on the Ethereum network. And so Ether uh, is a more capable cryptocurrency than Bitcoin just because it's much more programmable. Uh, you can create uh, much more sophisticated wallets with uh, you know, time locks and all sorts of interesting logic around how the money is used. Um, but it was never conceived as a money. It's a, um, it's a more expansive concept. And there are other crypto assets like for storage and bandwidth, uh, et cetera. Um, all of this is um, part of the Web3 world, the decentralized World Wide Web, where we have lots of these uh, interoperating decentralized protocols that uh, essentially will be the foundation upon, we, uh, upon which we build uh, the next web. So what, are, what does that next web look like? What are, what are you taking all this fuel and using it to build? Um, the foundational layer, um, there are protocols like Bitcoin and Ethereum, a whole bunch of others and uh, decentralized storage protocols like IPFS and Swarm uh, and decentralized uh, bandwidth and heavy compute protocols. There are a bunch of those on Ethereum. Uh, so Ethereum is good for uh, trusted transactions and automated agreements, but it's not really good for running really big compute jobs. Uh, and so there are a bunch of projects on Ethereum uh, where you can provision for some heavy compute job to get done and pay for it uh, using uh, the Ether token. Um, the decentralized web's about decentralized identity. It's about decentralized proof of location. So all these different protocols that constitute the foundational layer. Above that, uh, what's getting built out now is basically the fintech financial services layer. Um, much of it is called decentralized finance, and so that's uh, 
That's the building blocks, uh, the financial plumbing uh, for the next generation economy. So that's things like price stable tokens, its derivatives, futures options, other kinds of structured agreements. Uh, it's decentralized exchanges, it's atomic swap protocols, it's parameterized insurance products. Uh, so um, lots of the things that we need uh, so that when we're building in different verticals on top of that, uh, verticals like future of work tools, uh, verticals like commodity trade finance, um, healthcare, music, etc. cetera. Um, that's what, um, all these three layers uh, is what our company consensus is building out and, and many others in our space are, are building out uh, applications or some of that uh, either uh, fundamental infrastructure or the, the monetary infrastructure. You wrote something, uh, I think it was late last year, that I found fascinating about identity and, and the role it can play in terms of building a, a different internet. Um, you described blockchain as providing a better identity construct so that companies like Facebook and Google won't be able to build business models that'll be exploitative of our personal information and communications. Um, how, how would that work? Well, how are we going to do that? We'll be able to build those business models. Um, the idea there is that uh, um, I'm sure you've heard many times that uh, we are the product mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Web2, of uh, our friends at Google and our friends at Facebook and YouTube, and Twitter, etc. cetera, uh, that uh, we are being monetized. Our identities, our personal information, our attention is being monetized. And I love all those products and I'm, I'm grateful for them. But uh, uh, the thesis is that there's probably a better way. Um, that uh, the world is waking up to the fact that we are products and that our, our personal information is being used improperly and exploited and we should have more control over that, um, more agency over how it's used. Uh, so we've built uh, an, a self-sovereign identity construct called Uport, enables people to establish the root of their identity uh, on the blockchain um, and it can um, be used across different kinds of technologies, it's not just blockchain. Um, built something uh, personal data locker, uh, three box to enable us to encrypt information and selectively disclose that information in situations that we designate. So whether it's uh, sharing some preferences or uh, part of our personal profile with an application that asks for it or um, putting our personal information, maybe the really valuable stuff like uh, medical history, financial history, etc., uh, on a data market. Um, if we do want to monetize our information, it should be us benefiting from it, not our, our friends in those organizations so much. Yeah. Uh, so it, we, can, we can choose to enable them to access that information. We can choose to interact with them so that they build better metadata so that our information is more valuable to them, but that should be under our control. Um, currently, uh, it is definitely not under our control. Yeah. And do, I do think that uh, the business models of Facebook and the others um, will be possible still, uh, but they're probably gonna have to treat people better and pay people for that information. And, and basically data markets are, are gonna be uh, a great opportunity um, to transform everything. So um, the really valuable information will be uh, put out there, not just the stuff that, uh, that uh, is able to be scraped, uh, plus uh, the internet of things will be um, feeding data markets like that with uh, uh, enormous amounts of data. Yeah, so do you think that this could help customers actually get a seat at the table and have an option that they get to control as yeah. opposed to every time they land on a website being told they can either log in with Google, Facebook, or Twitter, yeah. um, which is not an ideal choice. Absolutely, so, so this is a, a single sign-on uh, technology. Um, you are in control of your identity, you're in control of your profile. If you wanna share certain preferences with different e-commerce sites, you'll be able to do that. Uh, so entities like Amazon have just astonishing advantages because they know your preferences very, very well, better than you do in many cases. And, and you can't use the site without being logged in. Like yeah, it's not, exactly. you can't get something sent to you. Yeah, so one could imagine a, a fairer playing field uh, for different retailers, for different kinds of services, for advertisers, uh, where people just have greater control and agency. 
So one of the things that the blockchain and the crypto market in particular gets um, saddled with are these very high profile scandals and mistakes from does that still happen? it is does still happen really? I, I imagine it's going to continue to happen um, even with uh, all the good work that our friends at the SEC I don't know why they're not on top it, of this it feels to me like so many more projects are doing their legal homework now yeah. uh, so there's still a bunch of activity but uh, uh, orders of magnitude less activity because you know uh, in uh, in the boom mm -hmm. uh, in the, the the token fever era, uh, the so basically for thousands of years, uh, unscrupulous people were taking advantage of naive people, um, preying on them because of the information asymmetries and blockchain made that really, really easy because it's very complex, because the context is global. The barrier to entry to perpetrate a scheme was exceedingly low. We've had some of our projects just copied wholesale and and sort of sold into an Asian nation or, or, or when there's like no that. when they, there's no uh, expecta zero expectation intent. it's going to actually get zero built. intent to deliver any value just intent to collect uh, tokens quickly and run away. It's spec uh, I mean it's pure speculation and, and many of the people that participate sure, so, are so there were a lot of fraudulent and bad projects um, because it was so easy to, to do those things but it's it's much harder to do those things now. So regulators around the world are coming down on lots of those projects. They're, they're developing a really good map for what's out there and a really good understanding of the technology. Uh, we've got two projects um, that are trying to s help self-regulate. Uh, so one really exciting project is called TrueSet. Uh, TrueSet is it's actually an open platform. It's in beta right now. It's a tokenized open platform, and it is incentivizing people, um, sourcing the wisdom of the crowd to create a, an Edgar-like database for the token industry. Uh, so we, I think it's like 140, 150 tokenized projects now, and people get paid uh, to upload original information on these different projects. They also get paid to scour uh, all the data and to um, correct errors. And so it's a game uh, that has been constructed, that is compelling, uh, and people are making money, uh, basically self-regulating um, the, the self markets. Self-regulating the yeah. industry. It's it's a really cool project. Yeah, yeah that's pretty. Um, that's kind of fan that is and kind of fantastic. One of the beauties of that project is that we've been been talking about these um, mechanisms like token curated registries and these uh, uh, mechanized game, crypt crypto economically. Um, incentivized game mechanism or mechanism designs uh, and this is one that's working so it's a it's a game uh, that is providing value to people and to the whole ecosystem so if people f sort of under do their research want to get involved how would you recommend people get involved in these projects either as investors or um, just taking advantage of the of the technology and the opportunities it opens up um, so it requires a lot of reading. Um, we hear a lot about people who um, get a tip from their boss or hear something about... Uh, I know some uh, of those people. Yeah, exactly. And they, they run out and they buy some tokens and they don't really understand what's going on uh, with those tokens. Um, but there's so much information out there. So uh, Consensus Media uh, puts out a ton of really high quality work. Uh, one of the projects we're associated with uh, Decrypt Media. Um, Another project that, uh, that does quite a lot of content is uh, Coindesk. Um, there's Breaker, uh, there's Reddit. Uh, uh, the signal to noise on Reddit is a little bit lower, but uh, you get a lot of information quickly and uh, you can pick and choose. I worry in, in slash, slash R slash Ethereum, uh, you can stay on top of things. The thing about Reddit, I think, is that people get trapped into smaller and smaller oh, groups, sure. yeah. so and then they get of sort of ra radicalized. And it, you almost have to, I mean, lots of different ways to use Reddit, but there's yeah. lots of ways to get lost in there, too. Um, yeah, for sure. So a lot of reading. If you're more technical, I would read everything that Vitalik Buterin uh, has ever written. He continues to do. Uh, uh, breakthrough, brilliant work. The, uh, I want to ask you some of the questions I ask all the people that come on the show. Um, is there a technology trend or that concerns you and keeps you up at night? Not really. Um, so lots of people feel like we're approaching a singularity where the machines will just choose to, it might be a good to build paper clips. Ray Kurzweil is looking forward to it. Exactly, he is indeed. Uh, I really feel like uh, 
Um, AI is going to be a commercial technology, but uh, there isn't going to be a, a singularity anytime soon where, or if there is, we're not going to know it. Um, we're not going to care. Um, so uh, it's possible that uh, AI will um, develop itself faster and faster, but uh, there are so many eco ecological niches on this planet already that don't care about one another. And so uh, if an AI ends up uh, becoming a, a super intelligence, uh, it's going to operate very, very quickly. It's going to, in order to operate very quickly, it's probably going to uh, occupy not a very large space. Um, it's probably going to see us as carbon mountains uh, that it doesn't really care about. May, I don't know, maybe it'll mm -hmm. take uh, mine my arm or something like that. I, I don't really see that happening. I, I see it uh, going off doing its own thing. At the same time, I think uh, as we build uh, trustworthy collaboration technology, um, these neurons, these, these brilliant things, uh, uh, very sophisticated neurons can all get wired up uh, with one another into a sort of cognitive apparatus for Gaia, for the for the planet, and uh, uh, we're um, we have so many uh, meshes of different communi instantaneous communication networks, and we're getting better at very fluidly collaborating. And uh, the Bitcoin technology enabled us to make decisions collectively even if half of the actors are malicious in 10 minutes and the ethereum technology is taking that to 14 seconds and soon five seconds uh, so we're getting wired uh, well to one another and, and there will be algorithms to enable us to make good decisions collectively and uh, we may just be that super intelligence that uh, that rivals ai so uh, no, what happens if uh if in this network or in this world, 51% of the of the population are bad actors, because uh, um, imagine so by definition they wouldn't be bad bad actors anymore mm -hmm. because they would write the rules. And then I think the 49%. I think we're living. Actors. I think we're living in that country right now. Yeah, that's uh, possible. The uh, and uh, so another question on our optimistic side: Is there a technology, a service, or a device that you use every day that still inspires wonder? Hmm. Um, maybe the Frappuccino machine? I think that's a first on the show. But it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I'm kind of used to my laptop and my phone. It, it, it's just, it, my, my hand should inspire wonder, but uh, uh, it's just as, uh, as common as my phone and my laptop. Good. So how can people follow you and, and find out and follow what Consensus is doing online? Um, so Twitter is Ethereum Joseph. Uh, consensus.net, uh, media.consensus.net. Lots of awesome content. Great. Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's Fast Forward for today. I'm Dan Costa. You can find past episodes of Fast Forward on PCMag.com, on iTunes, on Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere. Find podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you in the future. Mm -hmm.